This lecture is part of a series of lectures for RAD229, MRI Signals and Sequences, offered in the Department of Radiology at Stanford University. The eighth lecture on spin echo sequences is divided into two parts. Lecture 8b covers practical spin echo train signals. The learning objectives here are to draw waveforms for a practical spin echo train sequence, to explain the function of crusher gradients, to explain the CPMG condition and why it is important, and to calculate the signal for reduced and variable refocusing angles. So let's look at some practical concepts in spin echo train sequences. Practically speaking, we often use reduced refocusing flip angles, shortened echo spacings of as low as 4 to 8 milliseconds, crusher gradients, the CPMG approach whereby the 90 degree pulse and the refocusing pulses are, 100, are 90 degrees out of phase. We use the concept of stabilization whereby the first pulse here shown by alpha prime has a slightly different flip angle. And most of these sequences in practice use eddy current correction. So the first question here is why do we not play perfect 180 degree pulses? So I'll pause while you think about some answers here. There are multiple reasons here. So first, the transmit B1 is often not uniform because of dielectric effects, pulse profiles, calibrations, or transmit coils. Reducing the flip angle reduces the RF power deposition, or SAR, and especially at higher field strengths such as 3T or higher, this is really essential in order to comply with safety regulations. And finally, reducing the flip angle can actually produce desirable effects where we can actually improve the signal trade-offs. So we'll look at this in more detail. So recall from a previous lecture that you can have a spin echo forming when you have a reduced refocusing angle. So here we're using a 120 degree pulse. So we have our simple spin echo sequence here, but with a 120 degree refocusing pulse. So let's look at the magnetization. Remember we excite magnetization. It can be dephased by this first gradient into this dephased disk as shown here. After the refocusing pulse, what we have is we can decompose that magnetization, which if we look down on it, has this elliptical pattern, but we can decompose that into a dephased disk that has been flipped, which is the larger disk, and a dephased disk which is untouched, which is the smaller disk shown at the right. And this dephased disk that is reversed will refocus to form a spin echo. And you notice that the amplitude of this re uh, disk is quite similar to the initial amplitude. The magnetization that is, remains dephased is unaffected by the refocusing pulse, and this will actually go on to be further dephased by subsequent static effects here. So throughout this lecture, I use a function called epg underscore cpmg.m. It's a MATLAB function, and it's a very simple way to simulate the effect of these quite complicated sequences. And here you really see the power of the extended phase graphs, which we looked at in a previous lecture. So here is a sequence, and we're going to simulate these, if, these different time points of the sequence. So we first simulate the 90 degree excitation, and then we're going to repeat over the echo train. We have relaxation and a crusher gradient. We have a refocusing pulse, and then we have more relaxation and a crusher gradient and then we sample the signal at a spin echo. We can do this by when we vary the refocusing angle and or the refocusing phase to see how the signal behaves. And this is just an example. When we have perfect 180 degree pulses here, you see that the signal decays as an exponential and this function will return this, uh, the signal strengths so that you can plot them easily. And then we have a bit of a we have an image here, which is really an image of the coherence pathway diagram where the grayscale indicates how strong the state is. So what you see here 
for perfect 180 degree pulses is that the signal actually decays and there's actually no spreading into the, the transverse F states. And this will become more clear a bit later on. So let's look at this uh, sequence. You already know what's going to happen. On the right is sort of the EPG decomposition of the signals. And on the bottom, we're going to build up the coherence pathway diagram for this as this plays. So we start with the magnetization at equilibrium. We excite with, 180 de with a 90 degree pulse. And here we go. So on the right, you see the states forming and you see the, the spin echo formation. Okay. And on the left, you see the coherence pathway diagram forming. And what you see for perfect 180 degree pulses that we primarily have magnetization that goes between F0, F1, F plus sub 1, sorry, and F minus sub 1 states. Okay, and then the, the longitudinal magnetization is not really relevant in this case, even though there's a small amount that gets basically flipped back and forth. Now what happens if we have angles that are not 180 degrees. We've seen this picture before, but now what happens is we actually have some of this magnetization passing through the refocusing pulse, as we just saw a few slides ago. So here we'll have higher order uh, EPG states, and the magnetization will continue to fill these higher order states here. But there are different pathways to forming a spin echo. Okay, so you can follow any of these lines that lead to the red dot, and these are coherence pathways that lead to a spin echo. We can actually simulate the sequence using that same function here. And you can see now the difference first on the left between having perfect 180 degree pulses and having 130 degree pulses. First, you note that the signal level is not that much lower, even though we've reduced the refocusing angle from 180 to 130 degrees. So with a substantial savings in RF power, we still have quite a bit of signal. Now you see a little bit of oscillation in that signal, which we'll talk about shortly. And then on the right, you see our coherence pathway diagram. You start to see some very faint uh, signal in the higher order states. So that image on the lower right is essentially trying to image that coherence pathway diagram. Obviously in the image, you don't see the lines. So but what you do see is sort of the population of these states. So we'll look at a few of these shortly as well. So you may ask, what is the effect of the crusher pulses here? And I encourage you to look at the magnetization that is excited by the first 130 degree pulse and follow that dashed line there. If we have crusher pulses, the effect of these pulses is we eliminate these pathways in terms of their influence on the spin echo formation. And the key is remember that only the F0 state produces a signal. The other states are perfectly dephased at the spin echoes. And by having crushers, we actually eliminate a lot of the pathways in terms of their contribution to the signal at an echo. Now, it doesn't mean we, we eliminate all the pathways. You can still see very clearly on this diagram, there's a pathway that refocuses uh, sorry, that, that from the 90 degree pulse goes to the F plus sub one, then the Z one state, then the F minus sub one, and refocuses at the second spin echo. So there are multiple different pathways still that will lead to spin echoes, and we'll see how these interact shortly. So this brings us to another question. If we have fat saturated spin echo trains, as we saw in the previous lecture, if we remove the fat, but fat recovers quickly uh, because of its short T1, how does this recovering fat affect the signal in later echoes of an echo train? So imagine that the fat is zero right when we start with that 90 degree excitation. So the question is, when the fat is recovering, how does it affect the signal? And the answer here is again, that for any excited magnetization immediately after an RF refocusing pulse, is never refocused at an echo. And if you look at the dashed states, this is what I mean. So any signal that's recovered will follow one of these dashed line trajectories and will never contribute at a spin echo. And this is very powerful because you can sort of imagine the sequence as having sort of a gateway and 
nothing gets in. If it doesn't get in on the first excitation, it won't contribute to the signal. And this is very powerful because we can use the uh, spin echo train to image, but we've sort of got a snapshot of that contrast right after that 90 degree pulse. So now let's look at CPMG sequences. Most spin echo train sequences use CPMG. The CPMG stands for Carr, Purcell, Maibum, Gill. And these are uh, well-known scientists in MRI who together uh, derived this formulation. And what it looks like is that the train of pulses has this 90 degree phase difference between the, the excitation and the refocusing pulses. So we can start with a 90 degree rotation about X, and then if all the refocusing pulses are about Y, this is a CPMG sequence. Now notice we can have a different reference frame where we have a 90 degree X, and then we can actually alternate the sign of the pulses and have them still about X. And this is equivalent to basically adding a linear phase over the echo train, which will work just fine. It's basically a different reference frame. And what you want to do perhaps to add some intuition to why CPMG works is consider a dephase disc. And if you have a low refocusing flip angle, what happens is that disc will rotate, but it won't rotate completely. But then if you imagine the, the dephasing effects through the spin, so, sorry, rephasing to the spin echo and then dephasing again on the next refocusing pulse, you'll actually bring that disc back close to the transverse plane. So that may be one uh, interpretation that adds some intuition for you. So let's look at an example of a CPMG sequence. We have a 90 degree excitation about Y and the refocusing pulses are reduced flip angle, 120 degrees, and they're about X. So they're 90 degrees out of phase from the excitation. And we're going to look at these different time points along the bottom. We'll use the EPG formalism to do this analysis because it's quite simple. So we start at point zero with Q0. This is excited magnetization that is along MX. We play this magnetization through, through a gradient and this brings us to state Q1 and you notice the matrix here and the magnetization is now in the F plus sub one state. We play a refocusing pulse and here we'll look at the amplitude of the magnetization in the different states. And I draw your attention to the magnetization in the F minus sub one state, as this is what's going to refocus through our spin echo. And this has amplitude of 0.75. Of course, we play through another gradient and this will refocus to the F zero state shown at the bottom, where we see this magnetization again, and it's rephased. Now, if we keep going, we go through another gradient and this, of course, dephases again. And then we play the next refocusing pulse. And you notice that the magnetization now in the F minus sub one state, which refocuses at the next spin echo, has a magnitude of 0.94. So we actually have a higher amplitude on the second spin echo than on the first spin echo. And this is similar to what we saw, where the first refocusing pulse actually doesn't do quite as good a job as the second refocusing pulse. And this is, the intuition for this is CPMG, what happens is on the even spin echoes, you actually get some compensation for effects for the, the reduced refocusing angle. So the even echoes actually tend to be a slight, slightly bit higher. Now we'll see how this changes uh, shortly. Let's first look at a non-CPMG sequence. Now we have the excitation about X. So there's no longer a 90 degree phase between the signals. So if we look again at the, uh, at the magnetization over the first three points here, we see that now the magnetization is along Y. So it's expressed as a, as a plus I. It's refocused. And when it uh, reaches the spin echo here, it still has the same amplitude of 0.75. And this is because for the first spin echo, it really doesn't matter what that rotation axis is for the refocusing pulse. However, let's look at the remainder here. So now what we see is this magnetization dephases again. When we play the next RF pulse, 
however, we see a difference. We recover much less of the magnetization. And in fact, the second spin echo here has an amplitude of just 0.19. And notice that the 0.56 magnitude magnetization remains in the F1 state at 0.5, and this will be dephased further. So now what we're seeing is more magnetization going into the higher order states here. So this is a, basically a cancellation effect where the magnetization coming from Mz and the magnetization from F plus sub 1 are actually canceling with each other or adding destructively. So they're not giving us uh, as strong of a signal. So let's look at one more thing. Remember how the, the signal oscillated a bit on the CPMG? Well, it turns out we can do something about this with a stabilization pulse, and it's rather simple. And I'll try to give an exp an intuitive explanation for this first. So usually we're using re reduced refocusing angles as we've just seen. Okay, now let's use the um, coordinate system where we're actually alternating the sign of these. So this is a CPMG sequence here. If we look along MX, what we see is we've excited the magnetization and we look at how the magnetization just on resonance is rotated by these refocusing pulses. And you see this asymmetry, and this should uh, help to explain why the signal is brighter on the even echoes than the odd echoes here. And this is what we're trying to uh, eliminate this effect. So if you've considered this, uh, on these on resonance spins, well, what happens if we instead, for the very first refocusing pulse, we're going to increase that angle to 150 degrees. And if we look at what happens now, look at the symmetry of the magnetization here. So now, by using a larger flip angle for that first refocusing angle, we've brought the magnetization into this more symmetric uh, condition where the echoes have similar amplitudes here. And in order to do this, we simply change the flip angle of the first refocusing pulse, which we'll call alpha one, so that it is 90 degrees plus the remaining refocusing flip angle divided by two. Okay, so 120 over two is 60, and 90 plus 60 is 150 degrees. So let's try to look at an example to see how this affects the signal. So first, I'm just replaying the CPMG example where we have a 90 degree pulse that's 90 degrees out of phase with a set of constant refocusing pulses at 120 degrees. So remember that this, the first echo had an amplitude of 0.75 and the second echo had an amplitude of 0.94. So again, the second spin echo had a higher amplitude and hopefully we've seen intuitively why this might be the case. So now let's look at the same example but we're going to apply the stabilization pulse. So you see that the first refocusing pulse now has an amplitude of 150 degrees. So what happens now is you see the, the initial magnetization, but instead of 120 degrees, it's refocused by a 150 degree pulse. And you see that this gives us a higher echo amplitude of 0.93 here. Now we go through the sequence and you notice that the echo amplitude here of the second echo is now 0.92. So you see a really nice consistency between the echo amplitudes of these uh, two spin echoes. And this is really nice because these oscillations can cause artifacts in our images, so we can avoid that. So let's summarize different spin echo train results here. So what you're seeing here are signals as a function of the echo time for different CPMG and non-CPMG cases with 180 degree flip angles and reduced 120 degree flip angles, and then whether or not we use that stabilization pulse. So the first thing you notice is that if you have 180 degree refocusing angles, then it doesn't really matter whether you do CPMG or not, because those first top two traces in the legend will overlap. Now, if we reduce the flip angle to 120 degrees on the third line and we use the stabilization pulse, you see that we get considerable signal in spite of reducing the echo train length. Now, if we do the 120 degree CPMG with no stabilization pulse, you see that oscillation there uh, at the beginning of the sequence. And then if you do 108, 
20 degree refocusing with non-CPMG, you see that by far the worst case here, the signal drops very rapidly. It oscillates as well. So this is uh, very unusable for imaging for the most part. So another thing we can do is animate these examples here. So you see on the top left, we have the CPMG case without stabilization. On the top right, we have the CPMG case with stabilization. On the bottom left, we have the CPMG case with, or sorry, the non-CPMG case, but we have stabilized it for what that's worth. And on the bottom right, we have CPMG, but in the alternate reference frame. So what you should see is the two signals on the right actually are quite similar. They're just, uh, one is alternating sign and one is not. Okay, but watch how the spin echoes form with these animations. So we excite, we dephase, we refocus, and we rephase to an echo. And then we're gonna repeat this for multiple spin echoes. And what you should see is the bottom left is rapidly uh, becoming unusable, this complete cancellation. Whereas the two sequences on the right, there's quite a bit of consistency. In the top left sequence, Again, you get that oscillation between the odd and even echoes because we haven't stabilized the sequence. Okay, so we're sort of starting that again here. So another way to look at this is this animation here, where we're basically varying the phase of the excitation pulse here. Okay, so we're gonna vary the phase from zero to pi we have a refocusing angle of 105 degrees. So if we play this video more slowly here, what happens is as we move from a CPMG case here, as we go towards a non-CPMG case, you notice that the magnetization, the signal level drops, there's a bit of oscillation. You notice on the right where we're showing the coherence pathway diagram, that there's considerably more magnetization in the higher order states. So here you see the F plus states on the top, the F minus states in the middle one third, and then the Z states in the bottom one third. Okay, and then as we approach pi here, we actually, sorry, we get to the worst case here where we're 90 degrees away. So this is pure non-CPMG. You see the signal has dropped off considerably and there's a huge number amount of signal outside of the lower order states. And then if we come back to 180 degrees, we actually retain CPMG, and lo and behold, the signal is almost entirely in the low order states here. Okay. So again, you see the, the impact of having CPMG, it's very powerful. So we can take this a step further by using what are called modulated refocusing angles. So now we can actually use flip angles that vary, but still with the CPMG condition. So what you see in these plots here is as a function of the echo number, we've plotted the refocusing flip angle as a fraction of pi. So a full refocusing would be 180 degrees. So you first notice that on the left, that these are very low reflipping, refocusing flip angles. And then on the solid black line, you see the resulting signal here. So on the left, what you see is that the signal is fairly flat given this pattern. And on the right, what you see is that with a different refocusing flip angle pattern, that the signal is exponential, but we've essentially slowed the exponential decay. So this allows us to take more time to acquire image information across that echo train. So these are just briefly some of the benefits of using modulated refocusing flip angles, which are very common both in single shot and in 3D spin echo uh, techniques these days. And what you also notice is that in general, you want to use a fairly smooth uh, flip angle series in order to do this. Okay, so an important topic uh, to include here is that of phase correction. So while we're doing all of these complicated sequences, eddy current variations can be a problem. We've already talked about the CPMG effect and how important it is to maintain CPMG. So between the refocusing pulses, it turns out that the eddy currents are fairly similar 
uh, so they're less problematic there. However, between the excitation and the 180 degree pulse, the eddy currents can differ, and this can cause a loss of that phase difference, so you can end up with some oscillation, just like we saw in the non-CPMG cases. You can apply linear corrections here by modifying the GX and GZ gradient areas. And what I just want to show is the effect here when you have no phase correction, what you see is a little bit of ghosting here. So here the phase encode direction is from the front of the knee to the back, and that's the direction where we have uh, different phase encodes, so we might have some oscillation, and that oscillation when we Fourier transform it is resulting in this ghosting. And on the right, when we've applied this phase correction, this ghosting goes away. So again, the phase correction is a part of almost all uh, spin echo train sequences. So a final topic for spin echo train sequences is called hyper echoes. And this is a really elegant uh, discovery here. Essentially, what we're going to look at is the symmetry of sequences around a 180 degree pulse that's applied around the my axis. For this uh, derivation, it could equivalently be done around a different pulse. So the first thing is geometrically, we can see that if we have a rotation about z by some angle beta, followed by this rotation about y, and then another rotation of z about beta, this is equivalent to just having a rotation of, about the y-axis of 180 degrees. And this is nothing more than the precession that we have from a static dephasing or rephasing effect. However, additionally, it can be shown that if you have a rotation about some arbitrary axis in the transverse plane of an angle alpha, and then you have this rotation of 180 about y, and then you have a rotation of minus alpha with the negative or opposite phase, that these actually collapse and are equivalent to a single rotation about, 100, uh, about y of 180 degrees. So what this means is that you can take the following sequence and this will reduce okay, to a rotation about x because we can similarly derive this for a rotation about x. So what you see here is a series of refocusing pulses with angle alpha and phase phi. And if we simply reverse the order of these and negate both the angle and the phase, what we see is these would be equivalent to a single rotation about x. Now the power of this is no matter what sequence of refocusing angles you play, if you're able to play a perfect refocusing pulse, you can reverse the order of these pulses and bring back a very strong echo, which is called a hyper echo. So let's look at an example of this. Here I've actually chosen a random set of phase refocusing pulses and refocusing uh, phase just for n equals four pulses. So what you see on the top is the rotation and on the bottom is the phase. And you notice that we have a 180 degree pulse at 0.5 here as the fifth refocusing pulse. And after that, we have the negative rotation angle and the negative of the phase. So if we do this, here is our coherence pathway diagram that comes from epg underscore cpmg.m. And you see very interestingly that the magnetization has generated these higher order uh, EPG states. And after the 180 degree pulse, we're able to simply refocus this all back to the low order states, which is very powerful. And we can look at an animation of this as seen here. So watch this uh, evolution with random refocusing RF pulses. We pause at each spin echo, and these are awful spin echoes because we have very low refocusing angles with random phase. And somewhere in here, we're going to do a full 180 degree pulse. Looks like that. And now watch these uh, spin echoes form. And here we're playing the reversed and flipped uh, set of refocusing angles.
and remarkably as we come to the end here, these refocus perfectly into the hyper echo. So that's the concept of the hyper echo. So that brings us to the summary for this lecture. So this is all about um, spin echo train sequences that look something like this. So we have the CPMG condition where refocusing pulses self-correct on those even echoes. So you have an excitation followed by refocusing pulses and the excitation is 90 degrees out of phase. Or we can do this in this alternate reference frame uh, where the refoc refocusing pulse uh, phases alternate. If we use the stabilization pulse, this will help to balance the echoes so we have a little bit less oscillation. If we have non-CPMG, the signal will oscillate and decay very quickly. And CPMG also allows reduced and variable refocusing angles. And this is really essential for practical spin echo techniques because this allows us to reduce the RF power and also to tolerate uh, different uh, B1 variations in the B1 transmit field. And finally, this actually allows us to manipulate the echo train in many useful ways. We've seen how eddy current induced phase can disrupt CPMG, and sometimes uh, correction for this, especially when imaging further from the center of the magnet, is quite important. This is going to maintain the CPMG condition as much as possible. And finally, the concept of the hyper echo enables a complete reversal of a series of reduced refocusing angles. So a question you may ask is how are spin echo sequences related to gradient echo sequences? And we will see that there are actually some interesting relationships when we come to those lectures.